What separates good Marvel and bad Marvel? It sounds like a simple question, doesn't it? But when you start pouring over the dozens of movies that they've made over the past 14 years, it starts getting complicated. For me, the line that usually separates good from the bad is often the same line that separates the movies that focus on small stakes from the ones that focus on big stakes. When I say small stakes, I'm not suggesting that they matter less. They're just more personal to the characters and relatable to the audience, which is vital in order for them to actually care. Small stake plot lines focus on family dynamics, personal trauma, friendships, bloodlines, romance, and revenge. Whereas big stake plot lines revolve around the threat of technology and other weapons of mass destruction, huge forces like Nazis and Hydra, mass death, alien invasions, altering the flow of time and the natural order of things, and, you know, Thanos trying to kill half the universe. Janice Hardy, fiction writer and author of multiple books on writing, says this about stakes. Crazy as it sounds, you can actually set your stakes too high. The fate of billions is hard for readers to wrap their heads around, so it doesn't feel personal enough to really worry about. Do you really care about the fate of Middle Earth, or are you more worried about those two little hobbits? If the stakes are too large, find a way to bring them down to a personal level for your protagonist. Let's dive into the MCU, highlighting different examples of small versus big stakes, and in doing so, try to better understand how the treatment of each can either make or break a film. First, Iron Man. There's many reasons Tony Stark is so engaging. It helps when you have the charisma of Robert Downey Jr. I'll be throwing one of these in with every purchase of 500 million or more. It's a piece. But I think one of the main reasons audiences love the character so much is because he's relatable. I mean, you know, besides his superior intellect and massive bank account. He's human, flawed, vulnerable, and has zero superpowers outside of his Iron Man suit. His movies usually deal with some kind of inner conflict, like his desire to change his tainted legacy. I saw young Americans killed by the very weapons I created to defend them and protect them. Effective immediately, I am shutting down the weapons manufacturer division of Stark International. His relationship with his father. What is and always will be my greatest creation is you and struggles with trauma and identity. My diagnosis is that you've experienced a severe anxiety attack. The villains he faces are often demons from his past, a resentful business partner, a vengeful son of an ex-Stark employee, and a rejected and humiliated scientist. There's obviously some sci-fi elements in there, but it's simple enough to track the villain's motivations that stem from Tony Stark himself. That's what makes the stakes feel personal. Jarvis. Drop my needle. Iron Man 3 is kind of a forgotten film in the MCU, and that's probably because it was the first film that followed the massive Avengers movie. And instead of trying to match that insanity with massive stakes, it went the opposite direction. It went quieter, much quieter, like Panic Attack on the Streets of Nowhere, Tennessee quieter. Your fault. But those smaller moments worked for Tony, helping build his personality and solidify his relationships with those around him, so that way the stakes actually carried weight and meaning. It seems only fitting to jump from Iron Man to Spider-Man, because they're similar in many ways. Under Roos! A regular, intelligent person in a high-powered tech suit Except Peter Parker does have some added powers like his strength, agility, and spider sense. He's naive, gullible, but optimistic in a way that makes you want to root for him. I'm intimidating. Homecoming might be the most effective in its balance of big and small stakes because it's the simplest storyline. It's a coming-of-age story with a simple yet engaging villain with understandable motivations. Far From Home started getting a bit more complicated as they weave everything around a European field trip and another villain with another decently understandable motivation. See, that wasn't so hard. <laughs> but it's in No Way Home that the storyline became too big and convoluted, covered up by weaponized nostalgia. Now, it's hard to judge Marvel films on their own, and the Spider-Man trilogy is a perfect example of why that is. 
These movies don't really stand on their own. They're all dependent and stand on previous films. The Iron Man films had overarching details that rippled throughout other movies, but the main pillars of Tony's emotional arcs were for the most part self-contained. In Spider-Man, Vulture and Mysterio aren't attacking Peter Parker for something he did within the film. Vulture is dealing with the aftermath of events from the Avengers movie. I bought trucks for this job. I brought in a whole new crew. These guys have a family. I have a family. The Department of Damage Control will oversee the collection and storage of alien and other exotic materials. And Mysterio is dealing with the aftermath of events from Civil War. He renamed my life's work, Barf. And even the original Iron Man. Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a box of scraps. Peter Parker is always just caught in the crossfire of events without his actions being the cause of the villain's motivation. They rectified that a little bit in No Way Home when his decision to make everyone forget that he's Spider-Man backfires and causes the events that unfold throughout the movie. But again, all the villains and other Spider-Men, Mans, Spider-Mans, are just bringing in their background and motivations from other movies outside the MCU timeline. Again, the nostalgia is fun, but when the writers bite off too much, it muddies the water and takes away from the emotional core of the movie that actually matters. Spider-Man is at its best when the movies focus on Peter, MJ, and Ned, and their relationships. Which makes the conflict at the end of No Way Home so effective, because the movies are most engaging when the stakes are smaller, more intimate, and directly linked to Peter. Let's shift to Captain America. First Avenger, Winter Soldier, and Civil War could all be convoluted messes because of the high stakes involved, but the writers always manage to ground the stories on the back of Steve Rogers. In First Avenger, there's the Tesseract, World War II, Super Nazis, Hydra, and a massive jump in time. But the real reason this movie works is because of how the stakes are personal for Steve. Rogers, Steven. We first see him trying to enlist in World War II, desperate to fight for his country, but failing because of his physique and medical conditions. Once he's given the serum that makes him a super soldier, the smaller, more intimate stake becomes how will Steve emotionally and physically grow into his new body? And how will he handle the responsibility that comes with it? And as the war wages on, the other important through line is his blossoming relationship with Peggy Carter. They had a similar formula for Winter Soldier. Hydra takes a new form, but the more intimate and personal stakes are how Steve will adapt to his new futuristic world gives him with you to the end of the line. And his relationship with Bucky. Thor is our first non-human on the list, and that's where things start to get tricky. Obviously, it's hard to relate to a god with infinite powers, living on another planet, fighting aliens, monsters, and demons. But director Kenneth Branagh used his Shakespearean background to try and ground the story in story elements that are universal like power, arrogance, betrayal, family dynamics, and love. Even though I still don't think it really worked all that well. Thor 2 was a step in the wrong direction, going down the wrong path that some Marvel films do, getting lost chasing after a meaningless MacGuffin, where the characters have to find a thing to stop someone from doing a thing. In this case, finding the ether weapon before the dark elf Malekith can use it on the Nine Realms. It's the kind of flawed and tired formula that focuses more on story, but skimps on the personal touch that makes the audience care. Now, after saying all this, there are some exceptions to the rule. One of those is Thor Ragnarok. It's a big, wild-ass movie with gods fighting gods, prophecies, a trash planet surrounded by wormholes, Jeff Goldblum, And in spite of all those elements, it still works. And a big part of that is because the stakes, as massive as they are, are kept personal. For Thor, his father has passed away, he can't trust his brother, his sister, the goddess of death, has returned, his hammer is destroyed, he's brought low. Wow, I didn't hear any thunder, but out of your fingers, was that like sparkles? It's a chance for him to wrestle with his own identity and embrace who he is supposed to be as the god of thunder. It's too strong. Without my hammer, I can't. Are you Thor, the god of hammers? I mean, even side characters have personal stakes, like Banner coming to grips with the fact that he lost years off his life inside the Hulk. What are you saying? Oh, 
Uh, I've been a Hulk for two years. I'm afraid so. In Scrapper 142, seeking vengeance against Hela for killing all her fellow Valkyrie. I mean, even a throwaway character like Scourge has a mini arc that's effective, as he finally comes into power, uses it to hurt others, before sacrificing himself in the end. Again, it shouldn't work, but it does. Bridging the gap between humans and gods, we have two human hybrids. Carol Danvers, a human Kree hybrid, and Peter Quill, a human celestial hybrid. Both with superpowers, but still human qualities as well. But despite their similarities, I think the Guardians movies strike a much better balance of stakes than the Captain Marvel movie. Captain Marvel focuses so much on the mystery of who Verz is, but that mystery keeps us at arm's reach. We're always playing catch up, and though the reveal is interesting, it keeps us in the dark, which is a hard place to be in order to care about someone and to connect with them personally. She also has the problem, like Superman, where she's just too powerful. It doesn't really make sense. Any semblance of stakes is just removed because she's super strong and she can fly. There's very little vulnerability that makes her relatable. Peter Quill has mysteries surrounding his life too, but they aren't the central focus of the plot. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know how this machine worked. Guardians 1 suffers from the same issue of Thor 2, where they have to stop a guy from getting a thing before something bad happens even though I think Guardians 1 does it much, much better. Dance off, bro! Me and you! But both Guardians movies also put the importance of family front and center. That's what's at stake. From the very beginning, we see the effects of Peter Quill losing his mother, and in the second film, it's his relationship with his estranged father that holds everything together. James Gunn does an excellent job taking these intergalactic, massive elements, but shrinks it down to something digestible by focusing on family. I think the end of Guardians 2, when Peter realizes who his real father truly is, I'm sorry I didn't do none of it right. I'm damn lucky you my boy. Only to lose him moments later in this sacrificial gesture is the only time I've ever cried during a Marvel movie. That's what happens when you're able to shrink the stakes and make them personal. The four Avengers films are in a category all their own. They're such massive spectacles with the highest stakes imaginable. Domination of the planet, removal of all organic life on Earth, and the extermination of 50% of the universe. They're all just really, really big. And with so many plates spinning at once, a lot of the plot lines and character arcs get rushed or glossed over in order to squeeze everything in. That's why the individual films are usually more interesting from an emotional standpoint, because those personal aspects are able to flourish. Take the first Avengers film, for example. Captain America's complications with the future isn't explored until Winter Soldier. Thor's relationship with Jane Foster is quickly dismissed until Thor 2. Banner learns to embrace his Hulk side basically off-camera, with no explanation. Black Widow and Hawkeye's relationship history is given a few seconds. And the Avengers finally come together by flashing a few cards covered in Coulson's blood. I'm not trying to pick on the specific movie. I honestly don't know how they could have done it any other way. When you have so many characters and plot lines to juggle, you have to make cuts and rush moments along. Nothing gets time to breathe. A perfect example of this is actually found in the deleted scenes from The Avengers. It's a lengthier intro scene for Steve Rogers, where we see him watching newsreels of himself from World War II on a computer, sad and alone in his apartment, going through the files of his friends who are mostly deceased at this point. And then he comes across Peggy's file and her contact info, but wrestles with whether he should call her or not before he walks down the street of a futuristic New York City that he just doesn't fit into. These three minutes are quiet and slow, and unfortunately, I guess, didn't belong in a popcorn action movie. But these three minutes help us sympathize with Steve Rogers and understand where he is emotionally so much more. It's really a shame that it was cut, but it's indicative of what gets looked over in these massive movies. The quieter, emotional moments are left on the floor to make more room for flashier CGI action. 
My other big problem with the larger Avenger movies is that not only are the stakes too high to fathom, but the stakes are often an illusion. In the vast majority of stories, the ending is not a surprise. The killer will be caught, the girl will be rescued, the world will be saved. Stakes that only focus on the win or lose aspect are weak, because no one truly thinks the protagonist will lose. But they will believe the protagonist will have to pay a high price for winning. The more they care, the more they'll worry. It's a comic book movie. We know how it's going to end. The good guys will win, and the bad guys will lose. But the smaller stakes can still surprise you. The ending of Infinity War was unique and interesting, but the moment Black Panther and Spider-Man vanished, I knew this didn't really matter. I mean, those are massive characters that already have sequels lined up. We know they're coming back. It's an illusion. The stakes just aren't real. Now, this issue was rectified once at the end of Endgame with the departure of Black Widow, Captain America, and Iron Man, but obviously that was a special instance at the end of a long, long journey. Marvel isn't going to kill off their main characters and risk future installments that make them a ton of money. And so again, the story stakes are an illusion. This is made even more clear whenever the good guys fight each other. Nothing is going to come of it. It's not like they're going to kill each other. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. The most glaring example of this is in the airport hangar fight in Civil War. It's cool seeing people use their powers against each other, but what are we seriously watching here? A lot is happening, but also nothing is happening. What's the result of that fight? Rhodey falls to the ground, but he ends up being okay. Now, I will say that Civil War is actually one of the best entries that manages to balance massive stakes with more personal stakes. The sides drawn by their convictions, Steve trying to save his friend, Tony realizing that Bucky killed his parents. That's what made Zemo such an interesting villain. He's just a normal guy, but he knew how to manipulate our heroes by playing off of their emotions. He made the stakes personal. He's my friend. So was I. So, what separates good Marvel from bad Marvel? Well, the stakes must be personal and balanced. That's the only way to make the audience relate to the characters, care about the characters, and feel engaged in the story. Otherwise, we're just watching a lot of bright, shiny CGI that ultimately feels empty. Apparently, two out of three men experience some kind of male pattern baldness by the time they turn 35. Well, I'm 35, and if you couldn't tell, I'm a part of that club. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still actually have hair left. And that's where the sponsor of this video, Keeps, comes in. Keeps is a subscription-based service focused on making it easier and more affordable for men to treat their hair loss. When you sign up, you're partnered with a licensed doctor who will review your information and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. Then, your treatment is shipped directly to your door every three months. They offer prescription pills that block the hormone that causes male pattern baldness. They also have topical treatments like foam, pomade, shampoo, and conditioner. If you're already bald, hey, bald is beautiful. But unfortunately, this product isn't for you. It's for people who still have some hair on their head that can be filled in and strengthened. Keeps treatments typically take four to six months to start seeing results, so it's important to act fast. Go to keeps.com slash the elk, see everything they have to offer, and find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and why thousands of men trust Keeps in their fight against hair loss. And when you use my code, the elk at checkout, you'll get 50% off your first purchase. I actually just used my own code, the elk, to buy some shampoo and conditioner from Keeps. And by using my code, the elk at checkout, I was able to get 50% off. So you're saving a ton of money. I already need shampoo and conditioner anyways when I'm taking a shower. So why not get something that can actually help me keep my hair? Not only that, but when you use my code, you also help my channel. So consider checking it out if keep sounds right for you. I hope you all liked this video. If you did, please like it and share it with a friend. And as always, click that stupid bell below. Otherwise, YouTube just won't show my videos to you. I have a special announcement that Entertain the Elk finally has merch. 
If you click on the store tab here on YouTube, you'll see new shirts, new designs. I have some coffee mugs, a sticker, a hoodie. I'm just getting started and trying some new things out and having a lot of fun doing it. Check it out, see if you like the designs. Also reach out to me and tell me if you'd like to see something else on a shirt or a mug or anything else. Again, I have so many people reaching out all the time asking how they can help the channel, help support the channel, and this is just a really great way to do that. And a practical way, because we all need shirts and we all need something to drink our coffee and tea from. Check out the store, let me know what you think, and I'll see you all next time.